Neil, we are now in the scheduled 10-minute hold with the countdown clock holding at 9 minutes, still scheduled to lift off at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning. It does continue right on schedule. During the course of this flight, we'll be talking a lot about the military payload. This one is called DOD 82-1, and although the military uh, rather belatedly uh, classified it top secret so they couldn't discuss it at all, there had been so much congressional testimony about it and discussion of it in technical magazines that we all know that it's uh, something to do with an infrared radiance instrumentation of some of the packages on board because later on they'll want to have some military satellites and so on that can pick up weapons as they move across uh, the planet Earth. So this one is a Cirrus is the official nickname of it. It's the Cyrogenic Infrared Radiance Instrument. But as I say, the Department of Defense can't talk about that. One third of the 40 flights uh, until 1985 will be carrying military packages of one kind or another. And then uh, later on in 1984, the military will launch its own space shuttle transportation systems from Vandenberg out in California. Uh, Dick Valeriani has been looking into the whole military aspect of this and some of the controversy that it has generated for the space program. Here is his report. Recent congressional hearings focused on a growing concern about the space shuttle. Concern that a program funded almost entirely through the civilian budget of NASA may be overwhelmed by military projects. There's general agreement that Pentagon support was instrumental in getting the shuttle off the ground. But critics of the military's growing role were not reassured by a statement made this week by the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Lou Allen. We already depend very, very heavily on space systems and their capabilities for a number of aspects of, of warfare and including those aspects preceding warfare such as warning uh, and that I can see no prospect but that that will increase it's likely the controversy will increase as well as indicated by congressman Harold Hollenbeck the ranking Republican on the House subcommittee which oversees the space program the question of the decade may be then whether we use the shuttle for peace or for war now that the shuttle works, the military has climbed aboard the bandwagon. The gauntlet is down, and the battle will be to save the civilian agency that brought us to the moon and beyond. I promise you that there are fights ahead, and unless we are vigilant, the civilian space program could be swallowed up in the giant whale called the Pentagon. A man who has been to the moon and who is now in the Senate sees a different battle shaping up, a battle to make the Pentagon at least pay its own way. Uh, if you uh, just perform an objective analysis using the numbers provided by NASA and agreed to by the Department of Defense, you find that over the next uh, several years, the NASA budget will literally subsidize defense launches. Now, a little bit of subsidy is probably okay in order to even out the yearly fluctuations in the prices, knowing that that subsidy will be recovered uh, in later years. But the degree to which the, def the NASA budget subsidizes the defense budget is, is extreme. Well, your basic point is that the Department of Defense is not paying its fair share and should. There is no commitment on the part of the military at this point to pay their fair share of the operational cost of the space shuttle. And that is the uh, current battle. NASA officials point out that most of the shuttle's military missions will deal with such routine functions as satellite surveillance, weather, and communications. But some members of Congress are worried that the shuttle will eventually be used to launch this country into a military competition with the Russians in space. Richard Valeriani, NBC News, at the Pentagon. And back here, of course, at the Kennedy Space Center, the Shuttle 4 is getting a lot of attention because of the military payload that it is carrying the first in the shuttle series, and there will be a good many more before this uh, series ends. We'll be back with more from the Kennedy Space Center right after this. Back at the Kennedy Space Center now, I'm Tom Brokaw here with Navy Captain Rick Houck, who is a member of the Astronaut Corps. We've been listening to some of the communication. We have about two minutes left in a nine-minute hole that is planned before the scheduled liftoff at 11 a.m. this morning. We just heard the possibility of some trouble. They've got a little difficulty with fuel cell number one, and they want to make yeah. sure that that's all in order before they, they come they out. They one measurement that was slightly uh, out of limits, and we haven't heard any more about that to expand on that. All right, so we'll watch, and if this hold stays longer than the scheduled nine minutes, they may be working in that a while, but they've always been pretty good about telling us uh, what to expect here. Let's talk for a moment about the astronauts. This is an all-Auburn team. Uh, right. 
T.K. Mattingly, class of 58, as I recall, and Henry Hartsfield, class of uh, 56 at Auburn University, a couple of engineering students. Mm -hmm. uh, two guys from Alabama who get along pretty well. Right. Both ROTC students, by the way. Both got their commissions in that manner. Right now, they're uh, laying back. They're probably more comfortable than you and I are, Tom, because they're laying back on their backs in the seats and have their air-conditioned suits on, getting a good breath of fresh air. So they're just waiting right now. There's nothing that they have, have to do. Have they completed most of their checklist at this point? Yes, they have. One of the major things they'll do when we come out of this hold is at T minus five minutes, they'll start the APUs. Okay. Uh, among other things, uh, Hartsfield may have to take a little medication because they've been having some trouble with uh, motion sickness on these flights. Let's take a look now at these two astronauts, Thomas Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield and the lives that they have led getting to this very dramatic point. Astronaut Mattingly hopes that someday the people who run the space program will send a poet aboard the shuttle so he or she can come back and describe just how beautiful the whole thing is. Meanwhile, Mattingly has his own feelings. He says, Space shuttle is a freeway going into the future. Astronaut Hank Hartsfield's observations, on the other hand, are more down to earth. I'm ready. Mattingly and Hartsfield, a study in contrast. To begin with, Mattingly, while younger, is the more experienced. He's been an astronaut since 1966, he's been to the moon and back aboard Apollo 16, and he's had just one major career disappointment. He was scrubbed from the Apollo 13 mission three days before the launch because he'd been exposed to German measles. That's an experience he's not forgotten. That's what Ken Mattingly. Do any of your friends have German measles these days? <laughs> No. <laughs> Hartsfield has been an astronaut since 1969. Before that, he was with the Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program, which was then canceled. This will be his first space flight. And while waiting, his hair has turned gray, literally. I'll have to admit that uh, uh, there were several low points. The lowest probably was, was when the Mo program was canceled. And then uh, everything got bright again. I came down here and then it was very obvious in the early 70s that uh, with the curtailment in the Apollo program and cut back in Skylab, things were going downhill again. Uh, and it was very easy to see that there were not going to be any flight opportunities in the very near future. And this was depressing, I'll have to be honest with you. It, uh, it began to look like things were just a little too far away from me. Uh, but I couldn't think of anything else though that I would rather do. It turns out these two astronauts went to the same university, Auburn, although not at the same time. Hartsfield, class of 1954. Mattingly is class of 1958. According to one of his professors, Mattingly was a real go-getter. In his senior year, he was president of the student government. One of Hartsfield's professors remembers him as a good, capable student and easygoing. I had a good time when I was school. And his partner thinks they'll have a good time in space. Because space flight is is an ex exhilarating is the only word I can think of to describe the feeling. A poet might say it more poetically, but then again, a poet might be just as awed by spaceflight as an astronaut. We may have an answer to all of that by the 21st century. We're back and we're counting at uh, seven minutes and 52 seconds, as you can see, to the scheduled launch. That is the real-time countdown right now still scheduled for 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning. All procedures are operating as they are expected to, so far as we know. We think that we will have an on-time liftoff here from the Kennedy Space Center. We'll be back with more from the Kennedy Space Center, including the launch, right after this. NBC News coverage of the launch. We're back at the Kennedy Space Center and we're getting on with it with uh, five minutes and 14 seconds now to the scheduled launch of Space Shuttle 4. Captain Rick Houck, a member of the Astronaut Corps, what should we listen for as they lift off? I think there are four calls that the folks ought to listen for. About 10 seconds after launch, they should hear the pilot or the commander call out, roll program. And that's when the orbiter makes that beautiful turn as it heads down range. And that's sort of a communications check. The second one is SRB SEP, Solid Rocket Booster Separation. That's about two minutes after liftoff and uh, they can help locate the boosters by that call. Then about eight and a half minutes into the flight, it's MECO, main engine cutoff. That's when the three main engines finally terminate, 
and then about 30 seconds after that, they'll probably hear a call of ET set. That's external tank separation, and that means the orbiter's by itself, and it's about to light its uh, two ohms engines to go into orbit. Okay, those are the calls that we'll all be listening for, and I know that the folks in Utah will be especially interested in this because there are nine experiments on board in the getaway special from Utah State University, everything from brine shrimp to uh, fruit flies and how they perform in zero G. What we're going to do right now with uh, four minutes and, oh, about four minutes approximately to count down is we're going to turn you over to Hugh Harris, who is the voice of the Kennedy Space Center, and he'll take you through all the final procedures and then we'll have liftoff, we expect, right on schedule. All we know, although we know in the past, from experiences then, that we can be disappointed with less than a minute to go, but we don't expect any problems here today. As you can see, a lot of activity beginning to be generated now around the launch pad three here at the Kennedy Space Center. So here once again, Hugh Harris. The final helium purge of the orbiter's main engines has started to ensure there's no surplus hydrogen or oxygen in the area at the time of ignition. T-minus three minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. The Elevon speed brakes and rudders are moved through a pre-programmed pattern at this point to ensure they're ready uh, to be used during flight. The shuttle is now on internal power. However, the fuel cells are still receiving their fuels from ground support equipment for another minute. T-minus three minutes, five seconds, and counting. The engine gimbal or movement check is underway. T minus three minutes and counting. T minus two minutes, 54 seconds. The liquid oxygen valve for filling the external tank is closed and pressurization has begun. After the tank is pressurized, the hold capability is limited to three minutes and 36 seconds. T minus two minutes, 40 seconds and counting. The gaseous oxygen vent arm will be retracted. T minus two minutes, 30 seconds. The fuel cell ground supply of oxygen and hydrogen has been terminated and the vehicle is now using its onboard supply. The gaseous oxygen vent arm has been retracted. T minus two minutes, 15 seconds and counting. The main engines have been moved to start position. The astronauts have cleared the caution and memory warnings uh, in their onboard computers and verified there are no unexpected errors. T minus two minutes and counting. The astronauts are configuring the auxiliary power units for liftoff. The liquid hydrogen vent valve has been closed and flight pressurization underway. T minus one minute, 45 seconds. The computer will automatically verify the readiness of the main engines to start at T minus one minute. T minus 90 seconds and counting. T minus 1 minute 20 seconds and counting. The liquid hydrogen tank is at flight pressure. Coming up on the 1 minute point in our countdown. Coming up on T minus one minute. T minus one minute and counting. The firing system for the sound suppression water system on the pad is armed. T minus 45 seconds. We're 14 seconds away from switching command of the countdown from the ground computers to the onboard computers. And the development flight instrumentation recorders are on. T minus 35 seconds. The Gox vent arm is fully retracted and we're switching control of the countdown to the onboard computers. T minus 25 seconds. The SRB hydraulic power units have started. T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine ignition, four, three, two, one, and we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle on its first mission, and we have cleared the tower. Houston now controlling, mission control confirmed, roll maneuver starting. 20 seconds, roughly good. 
26 seconds, roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, one nautical mile in altitude, throttling engines down to 65% now as program. 36 seconds, plot board status looks good, mission control. 42 seconds, Columbia now three nautical miles in altitude. 46 seconds, coming up on create a maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. 52 seconds, Columbia now four nautical miles in altitude. 56 seconds, pass through max Q, still looking good, throttling in. Giving a go at throttle up. Mark one minute, 10 seconds. Columbia now seven nautical miles in altitude, four nautical miles downrange. One minute, 20 seconds. Columbia now nine nautical miles in altitude, six nautical miles downrange. One minute, 30 seconds. Columbia now 12 nautical miles in altitude, nine nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 3,900 feet per second. One minute, 42 seconds. Coming up now on negative seats where altitude is too high for ejection seat use. Columbia, Houston, negative seats. Roger, negative seats. One minute, 57 seconds. Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude, uh, 21 nautical miles down range. Two minutes, three seconds, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Right, there you have the animation as we are showing you what is actually happening in space, although that's our animated picture right now. The big solid rocket boosters are separating. They've done their work. They're uh, there for about two minutes. This uh, flight is the best yet in the uh, space shuttle test series, right off, right on schedule. There you can see the picture. That's you can still see now. the three main engines burning there, that yep. little triangle of light. Oh, that was beautiful. Two minutes, 35 That's seconds. Not Columbia, with us. He'd never seen one of these before. <laughs> I hope the next one I have to watch it from inside. Yeah, not too bad. It's April of next year. All right. We're waiting now for, uh, as you can see, the external tank separation in six minutes. Uh, that's when it's scheduled to happen as they fly down range over the Atlantic Ocean here. They're just uh, sitting in there monitoring their systems. Henry in the right seat is probably changing displays on his uh, cathode ray tube, looking at the various systems and just making himself feel good that everything's working good. Columbia Houston, you have two engine towel capability. Two engine towel, that means that if they were to lose one engine now, they could still make it to Dakar, Senegal. Okay. Columbia now has landing capability at Dakar Airport should one engine go out. Three minutes, 20 seconds. Columbia now 44 nautical miles in altitude, 83 nautical miles downrange. The return status check and mission control by Flight Director Tom Holloway. Three minutes, 35 seconds. Mattingly and Hartsfield giving a go to continue. Three minutes, 40 seconds. Columbia now 48 nautical miles in altitude, 102 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 7,800 feet per second. All right. Uh, what you see there in that middle box just to the left, that's the time to the external tank separation. Four minutes and 54 seconds and counting right now. That big brown tank will break away and break up as it goes down over the ocean. We'll be back uh, to see how that's going. Uh, we'll be back with more from the Kennedy Space Center. Right after this. Eight seconds. With that call up, Matt Ely and Hartsfield committed to space traveling. We're back here with our uh, astronaut from the Johnson Space Center, Rick Halk, and our space groupie, Carol Burnett, <laughs> who's just gone to general's rank in that category. I, but I'm astounded about the whole thing. We were standing out there, and you know how hot it is. Right. I got goosebumps. I got cold. It was fascinating. The sound is something the that we just... The sound is... An, yeah, it's like an earthquake, you know, and then all of that fire going up and everything. How are they going to sleep with all that going on? <laughs> I you still want to go. I think yes, I do. Oh. I suspect for the first 12 or 13 minutes, they probably won't yeah, want to sleep. I guess they're a little busy. We so gotta... And let me just ask you, did someone just tell me outside uh, that uh, they're going over Europe, and in an hour, they're going to be uh, over Hawaii? That's right. It'll be about an hour and 30 minutes before they're back overhead. You can get That's home in a hurry. That's fast. That's fast, isn't it? You could get home in a hurry, I Ella. sure could. Oh, gosh, it was wonderful. 
Well, it was awfully good of you to come down here, and I know you've collected enough souvenirs. Look at all of that. I've got this. Uh, thanks for my NBC shirt. I love it. Oh, thank you for everything. Well, that's that's I it in lieu of your after payment, actually. I guess, do I get to get these? No, <laughs> no these are I yours. guess not. We ought to bring you up to date on what is happening right now down Rage Carol. We're going to show you a little animation of what's going to happen next. As long as you're going to get involved in this program, we're going to make you a technical expert as well. Learn the acronyms, Carol. Yeah, okay. you get to learn all the things that we're talking about. What they're getting ready to do is, we said just a few moments ago, is to get ready. ETS stands for external tank separation. That's that big fuel tank, that big brown thing that was on there. And that's going to, they're going to blow that away from the Columbia orbiter. And uh, it will then break up over the Indian Ocean. And as Rick pointed out yesterday, where there is no discernible life as right. we know it. So nobody gets hurt in the process. I might mention that right after that external tank separates, is really probably the busiest time for them. The next two minutes, they have to get configured for the next ohms engine or orbital maneuvering system burn so uh, two minutes uh, after external tank a very very busy time and uh, 66 nautical miles down range now that's what's happening right in, in 30 seconds they'll lose that 20 seconds that is what's good mission control everything's sounding good eight minutes 29 seconds standing by now for main engine cutoff that's the Miko we were talking about, main engine cut off in about 10 seconds. The main engine has been fueled by that big external tank, Eight of minutes, course. They're running out of gas is what it amounts to. Confirm shutdown. To they do have the enough. Time, uh, not yet returned to orbit. Standing by now for external tank separation. That's what should be happening right now. That's a good picture from a previous mission. That's the external tank looking out through one of the cameras. Confirm external tank separation. Uh, Columbia now moving below and beyond the external tank. OK, that's confirmed now. Go, no, go status check and mission control by Flight Director Tom Hol Holloway for the first ohms burning, shutting down the auxiliary power unit. They're getting a go, no, go in the mission control center in Houston now for uh, shutting down the APUs. Once they shut down the APUs, they've secured their hydraulic system, and they're, they're pretty well committed to it. That's the auxiliary power unit, of course, right. which we've heard a lot about on these previous flights. Okay, everything is looking very good here for Space Shuttle 4. It launched right on time. Uh, all of the counts and all the calls that you can hear this morning so far have gone off extremely well. Scheduled 113 orbits, landing next week, July 4th, in California. The astronauts are Thomas Kenneth Mattingly, known as TK to his friends, he's the commander, and Henry Hartsfield, a retired Air Force colonel, sitting in the right-hand seat. We'll be back with more. Okay, okay, we're getting coming up on OMS-1 now. This is the orbital maneuver system, burn number one. That gets them into a proper configuration so that they can get into... Into an orbit, right. Into an orbit. Uh, this will lift them up to about 130 miles above the Earth for their, what we call their apogee, or highest part of the orbit. And then uh, halfway around the world, they'll light that engine again and circularize the orbit. And then we can say for sure that they're in a stable 130-mile orbit. So that's about 40 minutes from now. Columbia now in uh, proper attitude for the first ohms burn. They're going to be running at about, uh, what, 155, 160 miles above Prop Systems Earth, Engineer you know, about the average. Ignition that's correct, on yeah. both ohms engine looks good. And that's about a 90-minute uh, period. Every 90 minutes they go around the Earth one time. Okay, almost one went just fine, so they're going, into, uh, they're going into orbit in good shape. We're going to show you one more time the liftoff this morning. Let us show you what happened at 11 a.m. right on schedule, Eastern Daylight Time this morning, Space Shuttle 4 going off the pad. We gonna see that? <coughs> we can't see it. When 12 minutes into the flight, they've had a successful OMS-1. All the solid rockets went away on schedule, as did the external tank. Everything continuing to look very good. Uh, this is, I think that it's fair to say, the best on time oh, and more, really most fault-free of the launches that it they've had. And I think NASA felt a little pressure about getting this one off. Oh, I right think so. Time. Well, we, we always do. You want to do things right, you want to do them uh, on time, and that's part of the uh, business in the space business and be able to provide a service on time. Well, especially when you're trying to be commercial about exactly. it. Uh, exactly. We have Roy Neal standing by at Mission Control, which, of course, is at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. How does it look down there, Roy? Tom, the big word in Mission Control is nominal. That's, of course, NASA E's, and it stands for everything's going just right by the book. 
We've been following the book here in Houston, as have the mission controllers. This is the scene in mission control right now, and if you look at that dot on the big map up near the top of your picture, that's where the spacecraft is at the moment. It is out of contact, out of radio communication, soon to be picked up at Dakar, Senegal. A few moments ago, you and Carol were talking about how rapidly that spacecraft moves along. As we watch this map, it doesn't seem to be very fast until suddenly you realize that minute by minute it goes clean around the world. These mission controllers have been following and uh, have, by now, uh, monitored through the Ohm's burn that you were talking of a moment ago, the orbital maneuvering system. And of course, the next big activity for the mission controllers will be Ohm's burn number two on the far side of the world in about a half an hour. At that time, uh, hopefully, the flight will remain nominal. And that way, all those mission controllers will light up the sky with their smiles when they come off shift in an hour or two from now, once the spacecraft really is confirmed into a good circular 130-mile orbit. And that's about it from here. Okay, well, as you, uh, we can say it again and again, but you only need to hear it once. It's all gone extremely well here from the Kennedy Space Center this morning. Space Shuttle 4 off on schedule, and it's moving into its orbital configuration right now. It's looking very good for the two astronauts, Mattingly and Hartsfield, and for all the people connected with this uh, launch of Space Shuttle 4. We'll be back with more from the Kennedy Space Center right after this. NBC News coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle 4 will continue in a moment. Tom Brokaw back at the Kennedy Space Center where we are now just over 16 minutes into a very successful launch of Space Shuttle 4, the Columbia Orbiter with astronauts Manningly and Hartsfield aboard, off right on time this morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and all of their uh, post-launch procedures have gone extremely well as uh, as well. They have had uh, the successful Ohm's burn, that's the orbital maneuvering system burn, which gets them into configuration for orbit. They're now out of uh, range of the radios. They're headed for Dakar in Senegal, I think we believe, right. that they'll be picked up there next. At any rate, it has gone extremely well here today. Of course, when we're in a moment like this, it does raise a lot of questions about the enthusiasm of the American public uh, for supporting a space program, which can be very expensive. The most recent NBC poll on that question last August indicated that fully two-thirds of the people thought that the space shuttle system was a good idea. It was across this expanse of Florida scrubland and swamp, after all, that Americans watched the most dramatic moment in space, and that was the launch of Apollo 11, the first moon landing. Public support, public skepticism often is hard to measure about the space program. For most Americans, the big moments now are gone. That is, the landing on the moon, the first launch of the space shuttle system for other Americans, like my colleague Rick Houck, it's still to come when he goes up next spring, of course. For others, however, the enthusiasm still is there. Some of the true believers flocked to Space Day in northern New Jersey last weekend. 2,000 people crowding into an airport hangar in Teterboro. Their heroes still made of the right stuff. Fascination still with the marvelous machines that have journeyed to worlds beyond. The launch date is... Uh, they ask questions. The capacity for wonder has not been blunted. They sign up to learn more. They see the space program as a benefit for all society. Those who want to abandon the space effort in order to handle problems on Earth simply do not understand that solutions for problems in farming, the environment, energy and communications are out there. A week earlier on a college campus in Connecticut, another appeal for public support. Okay, what did you choose? A space festival co-sponsored by the Planetary yeah. Society, claiming to be the fastest growing membership organization of any kind. 120,000 people paying $15 a year in dues. Its executive director is Dr. Lewis Friedman, who spent 10 years with NASA. There's been enormous interest in space exploration. There's no question of that. Politicians even believe that the space program is good. It's just that extra bit of translation into making it a program that the government ought to do because it takes some forethought that it's something we're doing for the future that hasn't happened. Probably never again will there be anything similar to the massive government space effort mounted in the early 1960s. But the faithful still come to a Space Day rally in New Jersey, to planetariums big and small, now more than 1,200 across the country, with attendance in the millions and still increasing, to the visitor center at Cape Kennedy, 
now up to 2 million people a year, a 33% gain. And some stand in line outside a movie theater this summer, willing to pay $5 for a little space adventure on film. Coming up in 20 minutes into the flight now of Space Shuttle 4, and they are monitoring a little tiny jet up in the nose of the spacecraft, it sounds like now. The astronauts still out of radio signals, so far as I can tell. They're getting a lot of telemetry and data that is fed back into Houston, and that's where they're reading those signals. We have Roy Neal in Houston right now for an update on this mission. Roy? Glad you tossed it to me, Tom, because they do now. They've just reestablished contact through Dakar. They're talking with Henry Hartsfield, and here I'm talking with astronaut Steve Nagel. Steve, what is this subject about which they're talking at the moment? Uh, Hartsfield uh, received a fault message for a forward RCS leak. And RCS, that's the reaction that's control That's the reaction system. control yeah. system, and it declared a leak on one of the four or five manifolds in that system. It's not a serious problem. Uh, I don't believe it's a leak at this time. They're comparing the pressures and quantities, and they don't see any evidence of a leak, so it could be a false message. Kind of typical, isn't it, Steve, that at this stage of the game, they're settling down the spacecraft and they're finding out all the little things that possibly could go wrong but need to be bedded down before they can really say we have a good or a nominal orbit. Sure. As, as Rick Halk was saying earlier, they're preparing to do the Ohms 2 burn, which will occur around 40 to 45 minutes into the flight. That will establish them in this 130-mile orbit, and then we can sit back and relax a little bit more. And that's due in about uh, 15 minutes or so from right, right now, isn't it? Okay, Tom, that's it from Houston. Thank you very much. Well, as you heard uh, in a conversation with Hank Hartsfield, they said that they thought that it was going to be all right, that little uh, jet that we were talking about a few moments ago. So they are continuing on their way. So are we. Coming up in 22 minutes into this flight, we'll be back with more from the Kennedy Space Center right after this. Kennedy Space Center, and uh, Captain Rick Houck and I have been watching the clock here. It's uh, now 23, almost 24 minutes into this flight, which means they're about 14 minutes away from the next Ohms burn, which will put them into their final configuration for orbit. Right. That once means they're, they're there, there, I guess. Once they're there, then uh, they will do some orbit adjust maneuvers later, but they're basically in orbit, and they're, they're ready to do their seven-day mission. Okay. Everything continuing to sound very good here at the Kennedy Space Center. The flight went right off on schedule today. It contains, among other things, some getaway specials this time. These are little canisters that you can make reservations for, scientific experiments that must be approved by NASA. They range in cost from $3,000 on up. Nine of them this time have been placed on board by Utah State University. Uh, we want to show you one of the future getaway specials now. It has to do with space art. Lee McCarthy has more on that. Inflated sculpture floating over a city skyline or tethered to the ground and illuminated at night. Its practitioners call this sky art or atmospheric art. One of them has reached the frontier of space art and he will use the space shuttle to create it. Joe Davis, an artist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, will have a space art payload aboard the shuttle in September of 1983. What I want to do is to make a curtain of color in the sky that's visible from the ground. In response to our first question, how, Davis showed us the plasma fusion machine at MIT. It contains gases which are fired with a laser beam. That creates a plasma, a bright flash of light that lasts a fraction of a second. We could see the plasma through a porthole, but it was difficult to imagine as space art. So Davis said we should imagine a Las Vegas in the sky. I'm going to discharge inert gas and, and energize this inert gas much in the same way that inert gas is energized in a neon light bulb. And and create a plasma, which is, the, which is the, the source of light in neon light bulbs. And to do this, I, I will use an electron beam. But the neon art in Las Vegas is contained by glass tubing. The space art will be free to spread. Davis has no idea how long it will last or how big it will get, but... This phenomenon will occur over a space of many miles and should be easily visible many times larger than the minimum visibility for a brilliant object at typical shuttle altitudes. With the how answered, sort of, the next question, why? Why would anyone spend $100,000 to use the space shuttle as a paintbrush? The Greeks put stars in the sky to reward their heroes. And this is kind of an opportunity 
to reward the whole human race for surviving insane technology, for, for determination, for dreaming out loud. Joe Davis is still dreamy. His next project, he wants to put a 57 Chevy on the moon. Lee McCarthy, NBC News, Boston. Well, I suspect the chances of that happening are not very great, nor do I think that we'll see any kind of Las Vegas neon up there as well. NASA, of course, has accepted the reservation, but they still pass right up to the last minute on any of these getaway specials. Speaking of getaway, Space Shuttle 4 got away right on schedule here this morning. We must as well. My thanks to uh, Captain Rick Howe for being Thank with you, us. Tom. Good luck in your flight next year. I appreciate it. You'll be the first one to come back and land at the Kennedy Space Center, and you'll have astronaut Sally Ride along with him as well. We'll look forward to continuing coverage, of course, of all of this tonight on the NBC Nightly News and combining politics and the space program. John Glenn today on Meet the Press. For now, I'm Tom Brokaw from the Kennedy Space Center. Goodbye for all of us at NBC. This has been an NBC News...